Sometimes the best things in our life come from the lowest moments, from the moments of enlightenment, sometimes hit and bottom of some kind, all of a sudden wakes us up to what is in our way. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about today, what the author calls a blind spot, something that is in our way that we cannot see. And this is one of the things and one of the reasons why we need a coach a mentor, a trusted advisor in our own career, <clears throat> somebody that we can rely on to tell us what we don't want to hear but need to hear. And this in sales is everywhere. It's in every performance profession. We all have them. They might be minor or they might be really <laughs> significant. Uh, the most common ones that I see are people aren't good listeners. They talk over other people. They don't listen to comprehend. They're thinking solely about themselves. And in sales, this is by far the number one thing. They cannot understand the other person's perspective. All they care about is getting the meeting, closing the deal, getting their point across, and they can't understand why they're getting all these objections. Objections are the signal that you're moving too fast. They're not part of the sales process. What we see in our life are things that we're blind to. We're not getting it. And today we, I've got an author, someone who's been on the show once before, wrote a new book. And when you get these epiphanies in our sales career about listening, taking our time, focusing solely on the people that are likely to buy, not just anybody, and really analyzing our life, taking feedback, and understanding that that feedback is gold. It's not an insult. It's not a criticism. It's somebody helping you see how to get your game better. And what seems to be consistent among the great salespeople that I interview is they come from a background where this was part of their life. Athletics, you have a coach, people are constantly correcting you, showing you stuff, looking at a game tape. So let's go through this interview. And as you hear it, ask yourself, you know, if you were coaching yourself, what would you say is your blind spot? How's your listening skills? How's your priority skills? How are your judgment skills? How is your mindset, uh, your, your level of anger, your level of excitement, your level of energy, all of those things? And what could possibly be better? So let's get into the interview. Hey, and if you're in the courses, make sure you're checking out both the office hours and the one-on-ones. There's several being, one-on-ones being put up every week where you get to hear people going through the exact uh, steps of the course to get meetings and to close the complex sale. Also, if you're interested in the course, go to b2brevenue.com, schedule a time to talk it through. The right match is people selling B2B sales, not B2C, large complex sales, and people who want to become better. And please be serious if you schedule a time. That's it. Make sure you're also checking out CoVideo. CoVideo is the way to connect with your clients today. Uh, it's a very simple, easy way, and we all got to become a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera. The camera's on your computer, whether you know it or not. It's in your, on your cell phone, and all you have to do is show a little bit of personality, that big smile, the big difference. And once you're used to it, it's so much easier than typing out something, and it's a way of connecting. So go to covideo.com and give it a shot. Here we go. Hey, Mark, welcome back to the show. As a way of getting started, give us an update. Hey, Brian, good to see you and good to be uh, back on your program again. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of exciting things happening in my world. I've just published a book called, the Funnel, the, excuse me, the, called Blind Spots. <laughs> and I'm hoping we can uh, get to that today in, our, in your show. Um, still doing a lot of funnel principle selling, training, and coaching and consulting. There's still a big need in my space, the small to medium-sized businesses, for people to have systems, uh, methods to drive revenue, to have visibility to their pipeline, and, and then to act on it. Not just to have that visibility, but to know what to do with it. So, so life's good, still making an impact with a lot of clients doing that. Um, but uh, Blind Spots is a, is a new thing, and I'm excited to tell your audience about it today. 
Well, let's dig into it. Um, what was the, the impetus for what, what caused the creation or the idea for the book? Great, great question. Uh, because I think it's a great question because um, it was a fall. Okay. And as it is in life, um, we ha often have to fall. We have to stumble hard in order to really learn and grow and really become, you know, really become new people. And as it was for me, I was living a really good life, traveling ar around the world with, um, you know, with good clients, paying me good money to go to exotic places, doing funnel principle training and coaching. And, and frankly, I became really impressed with myself, okay, over the years of doing that. And I let my ego kind of get away from me, um, put everything kind of, I mean, candidly, put everything behind me. I was, you know, I'm a driven guy. I'm still a driven guy. I've still got lots of things I want to accomplish. But um, there's, a, there's a line there between healthy driven and really unselfish, excuse me, selfish, unhealthy driven. And, and I crossed that line. And so when I became aware of that, um, I had to look myself in the face in the mirror and, and, and say, basically, um, I had become somebody that I wasn't proud of. And that was tough. So over the next couple of years, as Richard Rohr would say, I did a lot of shadow boxing. And it took me a few years to get to the bottom of this and really to own it yeah. and, um, and to not, you know, commit Harry Curry, right? I mean, it's like, there's still a life for me beyond this really selfish world I've been living. So, um, so that, emer that um, resulted in me then seeing the blind spots, okay? I had blind spots. That resulted in me seeing the blind spots of my clients. That resulted in me introducing them to this idea of blind spots and my story stopped a lot of people dead in their tracks because I opened up. They were, these are clients. They're paying me to help them be better coaches and leaders. And I'm telling them how I fell hard and like, you know, and they're like, wow, that's really interesting. It, what it was, Brian, was a lot of people being able to relate, right? Yeah. Like everybody's got, for me, it happened in Singapore. Okay. I won't go into it, but my down moment that started. Oh, I read was about it. Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, oh, okay. There it is. It's in the book. It's in the book. Yeah. So everybody has a Singapore moment, I would like to say, <laughs> right? I've got a friend right now who's got some marital issues and he's going through a Singapore moment, you know, and he'll emerge if he's, if he allows this to happen, he'll emerge on the other side of this really, really deep valley. Um, a stronger guy, a, a better man, He's a consultant. He'll be a better consultant. So, so I've been doing more and more of this blind spots types of type of coaching then with my clients. I've never had more fun in my life. Yeah. I, mean, I, I love funnel principle and I believe we've made an impact. It doesn't compare to the awesome. impact I'm having with people. And so that's what I'm doing. So let's define what is a blind spot in the context of the book. Sure. So a blind spot is behaviors that you don't know you commit, okay, that prevents you from creating an emotional connection with somebody. Okay. All right. So that's a problem because if you lead a team, you take a sports analogy, right? You know, we overuse them, but they're pretty good most of the time. If you have a team of people, whether it's a youth soccer, if it's professional football, whatever, if you don't emotionally connect, then your players are not going to give you everything they have to give. Right as it is with a sales team. If you have a sales leader, think about sales leaders you've worked for in the past. Oh, yourself. I think a few. <laughs> okay. And you probably think of those maybe that you didn't emotionally connect with and those hopefully that you did. You would have done anything for these people, you know, and, and you did work really hard, you know, and you benefited in that. So maybe it's obvious why that's, that's important to emotionally connect. So blind spots prevent leaders from creating those emotional connections. And that's so, a problem. So, so let me make sure I understand. Uh, I'm interpreting it as this blind spot is blocking the communication and the trust between the manager and the team players. And what ends up happening, and you can tell me if I'm right or not, is that you end up playing office space instead of working. Yeah. yeah right. No, that's you don't, true. Yeah, they're asking, uh, what's your gut feel about the deal? And you're telling them what you, they, they want to hear versus the truth. Because if you tell them the truth, you're going to go down this rat hole that isn't going to help you. Maybe, maybe so. Let me give you yeah. a couple of examples because that, that'll help. So what I do, um, clients hire me to listen to the coaching conversations between their frontline managers and the salespeople. Typically, that's a funnel audit 
60 minute conversation that we've taught them to do, but it can be some other conversations too. So I hear a sales manager, I hear a salesperson on one of these who's excited about a new meeting he just landed with a prospect that he's been chasing down for probably six months, right? And I'm listening, three-way yeah. call, I'm listening, and I'm getting all jacked up, okay? But I don't say anything because that my role is to listen. Listen, yeah. um, And I'm hoping the manager goes, fantastic, Frank, that's great. great. Hey, um, what a lesson in persistence. Or, okay, hey, you know what? Let's make sure we got a great call plan for this guy. When's the meeting, right? Didn't get that. Instead, I got, on this, we're on the phone, so I got, Silence, reflection, and then the manager says, is it on your funnel? And I wanted to <laughs> look through the phone and say, man, did you miss that by a mile? Now, you know, your listeners might say, okay, yeah, I've done that before. Is that really a big deal? I'm saying that when that happens week after week after week after week and other blind spots like that where you're not connecting with your people, yes, it's a big deal right? Because at the end of the day, we want, we really do, even the hardest core salespeople who you think don't have an emotion in their body, they're just so driven. They, they, they want to work for somebody. They want to follow a leader that they believe in. And when you don't emotionally connect with your people, then something, they, they can end up leaving because they're just not getting what they need. You know? So what I heard there was the, the manager only cared about their vantage point. Was it in the pipeline so that yeah. they could manage it? Yes. <laughs> right. They weren't adding yeah. value. They weren't giving feedback. They weren't congratulating. They weren't connecting because right. what you really want to do is, well, how'd you get that? What changed? Yeah. Uh, how to go? Tell me about it. Where are you going right. next with it? Feed it, feed it, give it energy. Yeah. Mike Bosworth, I attended a, a seminar Mike gave, you know, he wrote a book, uh, yeah. What Great Leaders Do, What Great Salespeople Do back in 2010. And he was, he was selling his storytelling product, okay? Yeah. And I sat through a three-day seminar that Mike personally delivered up in Minneapolis. And he talks about tending the story. So we, we've all, as salespeople, we've now been dipped in this value of storytelling, right? You can go and get trained in how to tell good stories. But part of that storytelling he, he, he showed us was tending stories. So how well you listen. It's like, I have this really selfish part about me. It's, so it's not a blind spot because I know it, okay? When, I'm, when somebody asks me a question, I'm expecting that they're interest, interested in hearing the answer. <laughs> so, and We're I solving mean, a problem, maybe. I don't mean a 15-minute answer because somebody needs to cut me off, too. But it's like, okay, are you engaging? Are you connecting with me, right? And so when, I talk, when people will ask me something that, you know, they're interested in, whatever it is, right? Cocktail party, you know, networking event. Um, I'm, I'm really good one-on-one -on -one because I love, to, I love to connect with people and, and all that. So when somebody doesn't do that to me, immediately it's like, I'm not feeling it. This guy just asked me a question or she just asked me a question and I'm just not, just not feeling like I want to continue the conversation. Let me give you another example. Um, I'm in a conference room coaching a sales manager and her boss kind of barges into the conference room and looks at her and says, you caused me, you caused me to miss my number this quarter. And then goes into a little bit of, you know, not good kind of, you know, conversation about how that upset him and how that's going to affect the business. I kind of wanted to crawl under the table because it was kind of random. It was in the middle of something we were doing. And to me, that's a blind spot because that guy, he's a client of mine too. I know he deeply cares for his manager and I know that he wants her to understand why the, the number was missed and what she has to own, to own up to that. And I know he wants her to not miss the number next quarter. So isn't there a better way to have that conversation than the way he had it? I believe the answer is yes. I had another, another client of mine in a coaching session just he volunteered. He said, my dad was hard on me and my brother when we were growing up. He told us we would never amount to anything. And I'm saying, what kind of father does that? That's not motivating. That's mean language in the most intimate kind of relationship, a parent and a child, right? Do I believe he meant harm to his, to his, yeah. I don't believe he did. I believe it was a blind spot for him to think that somehow that was going to motivate. So the, my client turned out pretty good. The brother didn't turn out very good. 
This is a mid fifties year old guy who, who uh, drugs, alcohol, couldn't keep a job. Was it because of the way his dad treated him? I'll let you guys decide. So there are things you say tangibly, there are things that you say that you shouldn't say to your salespeople, to the people you interact with. There are also things that you don't say that you should say to them, to feed them, to nurture them, um, to create in the spirit of creating that emotional connection. And can we find our own blind spots or do we have to have people point them out? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, it helps. Uh, one of the chapters in the book, um, I quote a guy who's part of my men's group at, at the church I go to. And he says, I, I live in a nice suburb, Dublin, Ohio. It's, it's a very high class yep, place in been there. Columbus, Ohio. And, and he has this famous saying to all of the guys who joined the, 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 the men's group at the church. He says, you can't make it in Dublin, Ohio by yourself. And everybody's like, what do you mean? I mean, I got a nice house. I drive a nice car. I shop at Whole Foods. You know, I got a good job. What do you mean? We know what you mean. You know, we know what you mean, Mark. I mean, you need, you need a community of people that you can go to um, who can pull these blind spots out of you, uh, be candid with you. But there's got to be that trusting relationship. And it's not, you know, I'm a guy of faith, but it doesn't have to be always be a faith journey. But I think it absolutely, we talk about faith, spirituality. It has to be a spiritual journey, okay? If you're not into faith, that's okay. It's got to be a spiritual journey. And if you can come to that conclusion on your own, something magical has happened. And if, if you can't, then you probably need the help of somebody or a good book that you've read that just kind of rocks you. Yeah. And so let's say you find it. How do you fix it? <laughs> well, finding it, it's almost like the alcoholic who says, I am an alcoholic. They have to admit That's to a it. pretty damn good first step. Okay. Um, you know, and if, you know, if you're familiar with the 12 step program, one of the next ones has to be, you have to admit that you reach a point of your own helplessness. You can't do it on your own. So I think the next step, the next step for me um, has been to be, to, to not think that I'm the smartest guy in the room to ask more questions. Sales managers, you may know how to do something, but your job is not necessarily to, necessarily to tell. So maybe the know-it-all sales manager needs to ask better questions. Maybe the know-it-all sales manager needs to stop talking over top of their salespeople and cutting to some chase and making time for the learning to happen. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we know we're all pinched. Um, so I think it helps to have somebody that who can be a, a mentor, a guide, a coach for you yeah. on this journey, because it's really hard, if not impossible to do it on your own. So maybe the next step is to submit Submit, get a coach or seek advice from somebody within your company, outside of your company. How can I be a better, more effective a leader of my salespeople? Now, I, the most of the ones that I've seen are, have to do with this inner mindset versus outer mindset, meaning that they, they view the world self-centered instead okay. of what the other person is thinking. And so I'd say like number one would be bad listener. Would you agree with Absolutely. that? Or is, yeah. Bad, bad listener. And then if you cut behind that, why is someone a bad listener? Maybe because they think they've already got the answer. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Let me go down the list, right? Yeah. Maybe <laughs> they don't have the patience to hear the answer yeah. to the, you know, Maybe they don't have, they don't think they have time. Maybe they don't see that that's their role. Maybe they don't see, you know, I mean, when you ask, ask a sales manager, what is your role? I think we'd get a lot of different answers and, and there may be a lot of, there's complexity to it. Okay. But maybe they see a slice of the role and they're not seeing the, whole, the wholeness of the role. Yeah. Right. So let me, let me be clear too, too about something. Sometimes people will think that this is a, this is like, okay, uh, getting in touch, guys, getting in touch with your feminine side, working on your softer skills, you know, chilling out. And that can be what it looks like, you know, on the surface. But what, yeah. what it really is, is it's, it's admitting that there's something about you that may not be as effective as you think it is. And for example, um, I get into conversations with my clients all the time about somebody who probably needs to go. Henry Cloud, one of my favorite books, Necessary Endings. I get a lot of managers who struggle 
it, to create the necessary ending to send somebody on their way to some, somewhere else where they can be <laughs> successful doing something else, right? Yeah. And, you know, the world needs compassion and empathy when you do that. But what, what, what the business needs is a salesperson who comes to that conclusion faster. I help them come to those conclusions faster all the time. To me, that's an act of mercy to tell somebody, you know, after a lot of thinking, you don't fit here. Right. You have to go some, somewhere else. So I think that's part of blind spots as well, too. And do you see the, the manager who doesn't understand what leadership is, that they look at it as pure management, accounting, operations, as opposed to how to do the job, using judgment and skills instead of just the, the dashboard jockeys? I think so. I yeah. think so. In fact, it's so, it's so interesting, Brian, that you say that because the, the first title of my book was the, the transparency of something or other. And I'm like, who the hell is going to buy a book like that? You know, and, and uh, but the source of that was, as I looked at all my clients, everybody's got, everybody's got CRM nowadays and everybody's going to big data and everybody wants the analytics. And what that's done and what I've seen in my small world is Frankly, it's squeezed out coaching conversations. It's like, get to the numbers. Tell me why your funnel looks the way it does. Tell me why this is not happening. I don't have a lot of time. I got to get on to something else because the data tells me everything I got to know. And so coaching, eh, you know, don't really have time for that. Uh, go sell something. So to me, all of the data stuff has been, to me, um, ironically, the transparency, right? The transparency has not allowed us to see what's right, what's happening right in front of us. So yes, I believe that well, that is, that's the, happening. The data has just created a bunch of actors, meaning like I, I heard this discussion about win rate. Well, if you want to increase win rate, work on less deals. That's all you have to do. <laughs> you're not, True. you're not generating more revenue. Yeah. You just, you're just making the manager see what he wants to see. 300% of pipeline. How many times yeah. have we heard that? It trickles down, yeah. everyone makes it up. That's not data. That's crap. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I, th I see yeah. everyone's going to this AI and data. And I go, as soon as you tell a rep how you judge them, they're going to represent it that way. Right. A smart rep. Absolutely. It's like being stupid not to. Yeah. And if, if a rep says, that guy doesn't bring anything to my game, this is what I heard my whole career. I had probably two out of 20 managers that were worth anything. And all of a sudden, all the reps would just avoid the manager. Mm -hmm. And the manager was just a spreadsheet jockey, now a dashboard mm -hmm. jockey, mm -hmm. and is not adding any value. And that person's getting paid a ton of money to do an entry-level bookkeeper's job. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> right? It's like and, and you pay someone up, 50K right? to do that. Why is he doing that? He's doing that because the because person he reports to says, this is what it. I want you to do. I yeah. want you to go through the, the forecasting fire drill every 30 days, every 22 business days. 30 or minutes. Every quarter or whatever, <laughs> or every week, right? Yeah. As opposed to, I want you spending time with your people in the field doing what, what you know, sales managers used to do 15 years ago. Right. You know, I know it's not that simple, but in a way it is that simple. So there, we got to find a way through that. So you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's a, it's a, it's a leadership thing. It's a, it's a role thing, how, how sales managers need to see themselves. I think it's a senior leadership. They tell these people, frontline managers, this is what I need from you. You know, they say one thing, they do another, right? So they're not exercising good leadership to tell their frontline managers to coach, spend time with your people, develop them, et cetera, et cetera. And let's say you have a client or a friend, even maybe somebody already have trust and rapport built with. And they have a blind spot that is limiting their life. And you know, if you broke through it, and I always have this, I had an engineer on my team who had a, a body odor issue Okay, <laughs> and it was interfering with his success. And it was just, okay. it was just somebody who, um, you know, lived by himself, wore the same shirt every day. And I literally had to take him aside one day and say, I'm not saying this to hurt your feelings. I'm saying this to help you mm -hmm. and it's going to hurt, but it's not big. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and he cried yeah. and he didn't talk to me for a couple of days, but a week later he thanked me okay. and he goes, yeah. you know, I talked to my parents and they go, you should thank that man. Yeah. That's you know, wisdom, right? 
it's yeah but the way you but the way you handled it i mean i could see eight other ways people would handle that and it wouldn't be the right way to handle it it was probably too I mean, abrupt but no i think you it sounded like you handled it well i mean so you're exact you're exactly right i mean um we own it we you know if i get paid which makes it easier for me to talk to somebody about their <laughs> blind spots yeah. right Versus, let's say, a friend of mine who's not paying me to be a friend or to coach him, right? You know, and I have to say Voluntary. something to him, you know. So I think, you know, nudge, nudge is kind of a popular thing, right? I mean, you give people hints, you give people little things. I'm, you know, I'm a three slash eight on the Enneagram if you're an Enneagram guy, right? So I'm an in your face. I want people to tell me, Mark, you stink. Go change your t shirt. I won't be offended. I will go change my t-shirt, okay? <laughs> but not everybody's wired that way. Yeah. So again, back to leadership, you know, if you ask sales managers, you know, your, your team, not everybody's like you on your team, right? I think nine out of 10 would say, well, yeah, I know that. But then you're like, okay, so then how do you adapt your leadership style to get the most out of her who you got to, she's a two on the Enneagram. She puts everybody else first, um, but man, she's a hard worker and she's willing to, to, to do what, what's needed. How do you adjust your in-your-face style to not really offend her and turn her off? How do you adjust your style? This guy who's really analytical, um, how do you adjust your style to, to reach out to him and connect emotionally with him? So a little plug for the Enneagram. Um, I finished the book like 85%, 90% of blind spots. And then I discovered the Enneagram and I said, I don't know if I can say this, but I'll say it anyway. Holy shit. I wish I would have known about that because it's a phenomenal tool. You know, people throw it in with Myers-Briggs and all of these other PDP kind of tools. They all have some value. The good ones all have some value. The Enneagram is a phenomenal tool to help you look inside. And so I make it part of my coaching. I make people, after I sell them on it, I make them take the Enneagram test which isn't some truth serum, but it's a starting point. Yeah. It's, it suggests well, that you it, are such and such type of person. Let's continue that dialogue if you're okay. Because we're going to talk it about... it also makes you th remember that not everybody thinks your way. And if they don't think your way, that's okay. And the likelihood of you changing them is pretty small, but the likelihood of them wanting to change and fix something is higher. And the likelihood of them changing you is also small, right? Because yeah. we're, we're wired. I don't have to think about being competitive. It's like breathing. And my wife, who puts everybody else before herself, doesn't have to think about that. It's like breathing to her, okay? But both of us get into trouble in our own unique ways. When we take that, 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 that innate uh, set of characteristics of ours too far, yeah. she becomes resentful of people <laughs> she puts before herself <laughs> ironically right when they don't start to the reciprocate affirm her. yeah um my competitiveness turns ugly when you know you know in a personal matter right playing cards at home i mean i'm sorry win. It's, <laughs> it's hard for me to dial it down right <laughs> dad take it easy it's just a game of nature right <laughs> no it's not right so so it, it is it's about self i saw a study here on my desk a study that a uh, consulting company did Recently, Green Peak Partners, they talked about how um, the top traits of, uh, of CEOs that they studied, the top traits, a high level of self-awareness. Yeah. Okay. So um, I got a lot of clients that don't have a high level of self-awareness. And what it looks like is saying something that they shouldn't have said, it was a much better way, or not saying something that they should have said that would have made, a, made that emotional connection. So that's what I, I'm trying to do with clients is blind spots, make them aware. You got something called blind spots. It gets in the way of you becoming more effective coach and leader. And I've got a plan that we can work on to help you be that more effective leader and coach that you want to be. And how do you do it without making people think that they're bad or that they're broken or that they're inferior or they're flawed and just that you're human and that we, we can't, we have, we all have blind spots. You know, some might be gaping, others may be minor. And, yes. And I think everybody wants to be better. 
I don't think you, if you asked anybody, oh, I'm perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for checking. And, and they try to get better the only way they know how. They double down on, on the things that got better before. Okay. Yeah. So I was doubling down in pursuing, you know, the world domination of funnel principle, right? <laughs> and growing my empire. Okay. Uh, the only way I knew how work harder, spend more time in the office, travel more, make more calls, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I didn't see what was happening back at home. And, but I also didn't see what's happening, you know, in my community. I mean, I didn't have time for service. So I think how I help people become aware of this and, and to realize you're not a bad person is when I go first in this, I, again, I, I credit this to Mike Bos Bosworth. He taught us in this class. When you go first, um, it has an incredible impact on people. Meaning when you are vulnerable, you're more likely for, for, to get somebody that you're talking to for them to somehow be more vulnerable too, because you've just made it safe to be vulnerable. So that's one thing. So leaders and, and you know, studies are showing this more humble, um, more vulnerable, you're, you're more powerful. You have more influence. Okay. So that's one way. Um, I use the Enneagram tool to show people that you're, you're wired, you're wired and you can't rewire yourself. That doesn't mean you can't change. It just means that your, your innate motivations drive certain behaviors. And sometimes those, those behaviors are beautiful. If you're a great organizer, a leader, you know, we've all been in those meetings where it's like, perfect. I know the purpose. I know why we're here. And, the, and, and Jane keeps it on track. And we finished five minutes early, right? And we've all been in those meetings. that don't, So somebody who doesn't have a good skill set of organizing a meeting and keeping it on track doesn't make them a bad person but they need to be aware that, um, that that's happening. So um, we, we, we expose their natural abilities and innate characteristics and say, that's beautiful. It's beautiful when you do this. Here's where it's not beautiful. Here's where yeah. the competitiveness is ugly. Yeah. Here's where the, you know, putting everybody out in front of, in front, putting everybody in front of you, um, it turns to resentment because you're tired of putting everybody in front of you and they're not affirming that you're doing that. So when you, when you put it that way, and my clients, they're like, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so and, that's, that's what we're doing. Now, tell us about the book. You know, how do you structure it? And if people read it, how do they leverage it? And what would they get out of it? Okay, thank you. So um, I hired a copy editor, as any author Smart. needs to do. And she said, Mark, um, there's, still a little, there's still a little, of the, a little bit of the bicycle funnel uh, which comes out of the funnel principle book is a still, uh, still a little bit of that, uh, like two chapters. And she rearranged chapters to say, Mark, the story of your book is this personal story that you, that is, that's the nugget. So we put all that up front and I, I call it getting in your own way. Okay. So we don't know we get in our own way. So I tell people opening chapter, you get in your own way. Let me tell you what that looks like. Right. You say things you shouldn't say. You don't th say things that you should say, blah, blah, blah. Right. So then how do you get out of your own way? So let's talk about how do you get out of your own way? Another chapter, how do you stay out of your own way? Okay, so got awareness. I find myself catching myself, but you know what? It's, it's frankly, it's a lifelong journey. So how do I get on that lifelong journey plan to continue to be the great sales coach and leader that I need to be, right? So basically it's structured, you know, awareness, why that's happening um, and what you can do about it. So I think people reading it, what they'll get out of it is, I think they'll, they'll see um, a successful guy who has basically said, I'm pouring out my soul. You know, I hit bottom and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. The best thing that ever happened to me, right? So let me tell you my story. People love stories. I've got a lot of stories about people who have blind spots and everybody's hidden. Nobody knows who I'm talking about, but it's, you know, I'm just telling the stories of, that I've picked up over the years. So they'll, they'll read stories. They'll have a lot of examples. They'll have specific things they can do. Stop judging people. Stop trying to fix your salespeople. You can't fix them. Stop trying to do that. You know, connect with them, step back, understand, listen better, be more observant, blah, blah, blah. So they'll pick up some ideas for how to um, uh, leverage this concept of blind spots to be a, a more effective coach and leader. Cool. And just pick it up on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Yes. Um, we have a Kindle version. We have a, um, the hard, the hard uh, cover version. It's actually a soft cover. And uh, we will hopefully, you know, maybe by the, um, 
the end of the year, we'll have um, an audio version too. Cool. And where can people go to follow you? www.breakthrough-sales.com. I'm putting a lot of stuff out on LinkedIn, uh, tips and things. We also have a blog called blindspotsinsales.blog. So I'm really socializing the idea on, on that. Um, and you might find me in an airport somewhere too. <laughs> Why don't you take a look at you? List out the skills that you think salespeople must have. Listening, uh, understanding, questioning, uh, understanding the decision-making process. And that one is something that very few people understand. I recently posted a video on LinkedIn about don't ask what your decision-making process is. Why? Because they don't know. Yeah, they're going to say, oh, I'm going to take this and send it to my manager. Well, they might, but that's not a decision-making process. The manager is going to be like, what do I do with this? That is what I teach in closing the complex sale. It is understanding how people work and how companies make decisions. Nobody else teaches this. It's not in any book. I've seen it nowhere. Yeah, there's people who have labeled the people uh, coaches, champions, economic buyers. And that's good to know, but that's not how the process works. That's just naming the people. If you were a mechanic, you learn how engines work. You, you don't know, have to know, understand mechanical engineering, but you do have to understand how the engine works. You can't fix a car by sitting in the driver's seat. You have to open the hood and get in. And you have to learn from a master mechanic who's been fixing cars for 20, 30 years. And that's what closing the complex sale is about, is understanding how those decisions get made and how to control it and keep it moving and fix it if it breaks and prevent it from getting broken, which is even more important. And the only way to do that is understand how companies make decisions. There wasn't one legitimate comment on that whole post because everybody just kept coming up with, well, I ask, how did you do it last time? Well, what if they, there was no last time or the last time involved different people and different dollar amounts and different groups. And it was under different economic situations. This is what people don't understand about the complex sale. They're looking from the outside in. What I do is I open the black box of how companies make decisions. Because guess what? I had to figure it out. And I don't like to waste my time. So instead of asking questions and waiting and hoping and calling in and going top down and pushing and using discounts, I figured out how companies make decisions and how to guide them through that process. So if that's what you're up against, go to b2brevenue.com and sign up for Closing the Complex Sale. Now, all the courses include three major things. All access to the content day one. It's not trickled through. You can pay all at once or through 12 monthly payments. Not a membership. So if you sign up, you're committed to 12 monthly payments. And you get office hours, which is a, a meetup every other Friday for one hour on Zoom, which is a Q&A uh, case study based. What I do is I take real world case studies of people in the course and I explain how we came up with a solution, a better approach. And we discuss it and we see if it matches what you're doing and how what you're doing might be different and how what possibly could work. And when you hear other people talk about their deals, it starts to resonate with you. And when you talk about your deal, you start to see your blind spots. You getting the thing how it comes together here? See, we our mammal brain wants blind spots. It does. It keeps us safe. But our mammal brain only cares about today, our next meal, surviving till tomorrow. It's a conscious mind that has to get us thinking ahead and thinking through the, the large complex deals. And that's why it's so hard and so few people are good at it. Now, you may have another problem, which is getting into new accounts. And guess what? The pitch doesn't work anymore because they're pitched to death. They're pounded all day and there's no level of interest. We're not meeting them where they are and building up the interest. 
And in that course, I show you how to do it, how to go and attack cold accounts and how to build it up. And that the success that people are having is just phenomenal. And yes, I'll have them on the show, but not everybody has time to do a podcast like you and me. So go to b2brevenue.com. You want to schedule a time to talk about it. There's my calendar link there. Uh, click on the courses. Take a look at them. Uh, and the other element that both courses have is unlimited one-on-ones, which is a 30-minute Zoom call with me applying the course to what you're trying to accomplish. So you get to talk with me. And if it didn't work, do you think I'd offer free one-on-ones? No, I love doing them because it does work. Also, check out the other podcast, Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers, and the B2B Revenue Leadership Show. Uh, Check out the YouTube channel, Maverick Method, on YouTube. And if you see my stuff on LinkedIn, do me a favor. Hit a little thumbs up, a little likey, a little comment, a little share. I'd really appreciate that. And tell somebody about the podcast this week, and we'll see you next time.